Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bon appétit. Welcome to this morning's strategic session, dialogue, uh, the strategic dialogue, uh, entitled Africa's Upstream, Where Will the Investment Go? My name is Dan Burkov. I'm a senior advisor for strategic energy initiatives at uh, S&P Global. In discussing this morning's topic, it may be apt to quote Charles Dickens. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the best of times for Africa's upstream for several reasons. One is that the price of oil is now exceeding $120, $130 a barrel, which is good for exploration everywhere. Second is that Africa's rocks have been on a roll. They've produced some of the most exciting upstream discoveries in the world, and they've de-risked new frontiers for exploration. In this regard, few geographies can, can actually uh, show the results that we've seen from Africa. Third is that African companies, the, the NOCs and the, the IOCs, are sort of undergoing a renaissance. They're really growing in scope and capabilities, and they're becoming increasingly active in exploring and exploiting the continent's resources. So with all this good news, why might it also be the worst of times? Well, um, the past few years with, with the COVID pandemic have been exceedingly difficult for the upstream industry in general. And, and Africa in particular is, is stressed by the, the global energy transition's uh, insistence on decarbonization. Uh, upstream EMP is not as embraced as it used to be. And finance for hydrocarbon, project, hydrocarbon projects are uh, increasingly difficult to, to come by. That means that the continent's resources may, be, uh, may have to remain in the ground in certain cases, and that even discovered fossil fuel assets may be stranded. So it's a decidedly complex situation for Africa. Uh, and it leaves us with the question that is the name of this dialogue, which is where will the investment go? To shed light on these issues, we're very fortunate to have an especially qualified panel of speakers to, um, to discuss this with us. So please allow me to introduce them from my left. Minister Tom Alwindo, Namibia's Minister of Mines and Energy. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Bryant Orgiaco, the chairman and co-founder of Seplite Energy. Thank you. And uh, Minister Thomas Kamara, Cote d'Ivoire's Minister for Mines, Petroleum, and Energy. If you have questions, there are, uh, it's gonna be a dialogue. If you have questions, there are cards on everyone's table. You can write down the questions. My colleagues are, my colleague, she's just raised her hand. She will pick them up, just hold it up. And she'll bring them up to me. Um, so we can, uh, I will read the questions. Um, not sure if I'll ask them, but I will definitely see the questions. We have translation for Minister uh, Kamara as well. English is number five. Um, in this, and uh, French is number one. So let's begin, and, and let's start with, with the best of times with the good news. Um, Mr. Alwindo, the, the Venus and Graf discoveries in Namibia were highly anticipated high impact wells. How high has this impact been on uh, Namibia? Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Very high indeed. Thank you. Very high. Uh, as you know, Namibia, for a while now, we, we have been trying to find oil. Um, and a number of the major oil companies have been exploring uh, offshore and onshore in Namibia for the last 20 years or so. Uh, and not long ago, a couple of weeks ago, um, Shell discovered oil. Uh, two weeks later, Total discovered oil. Uh, that is really high impact, uh, and we are really, really excited about the, the fact that now Namibia is no longer just going to be known for other things, for other good things like, of course, Namibia is a very stable country, you know, it's a, a nice tourist country. You know, some of you who haven't been to Namibia, I want to invite you to come to Namibia. Now, it won't only now be known for some of those things, it also will be known as an oil producing country. So it's really make us very, very excited. Um, but as you say, uh, it comes now at a time when the world is talking about the energy transitions and therefore it's something that we need to start to grapple with and how do we deal with that. Uh, but we would really want to thank the, uh, the, the Total and, and the Shell, uh, those who actually find it necessary to come and invest <laughs> with us. 
uh, and we would like to again, I think, um, uh, um, invite all of you to come. Now, oil. In fact, when the discovery was made, the question is now being asked. You know, to me, is always like, oh, is um, now oil discovery going to be um, a blessing or is going to be a curse? Uh, Oil discovery is always associated with being a case, especially when it's on the African continent. And it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, we do not have to go that route, that narrative to say oil discovery means uh, a case for an African country. It can really be a very transformative um, economic issues. And in Namibia, we intend to make sure that oil discovery really become a transformative uh, catalyst for economic development for our country. And knowing where we are in most of our countries, the development we have, certainly a resource like oil can go a long way to make sure that we create a dynamic economy, which can also be uh, easy for, for other investors to come and invest, simply because you discover oil, suddenly there are other issues or there are other sectors within which company or can come and invest in. So certainly we intend to make sure that the oil discovery is going to go um, in the right direction to make sure that Namibia <coughs> becomes a dynamic economy like all the other oil um, producing countries. High impact indeed. High impact indeed, yes. Uh, Brian, yep. despite being a fairly young company, Seplet has grown and transformed considerably during its lifetime. It's recently rebranded from Seplet Petroleum to Seplet Energy, and recently uh, you had a $1.3 billion deal to uh, buy ExxonMobil's Nigerian offshore shallow water assets, and you propelled, it's propelled Seplat to be one of the largest IOCs in the world now. Tell us about Seplat and, and this journey. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, and um, it's my great pleasure to, to be in this panel. Uh, Seplat started 2010 as a Nigerian company and has remained so, but, but really the, the way to understand what Seplat has done is to see where we started. We pioneered acquisition of oil assets from international oil companies, Shell, Total, and ENI. And, and we started with three assets in the Western Niger Delta. These assets were doing average 14,000 barrels a day of liquids. <coughs> Fast forward to today, from the same assets, we're doing, of course, with further acquisitions, we're doing 100,000 barrels a day of liquids. And we're doing as high as 300 millions of a day of gas within a period of 10 to, 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 to 12 years. And in addition to that, what, one of the things we've, we've done is to bring this company to international scrutiny. And that's why we, again, led, led through by the front by, by listing this company in the London Stock Exchange as well as Nigerian Stock Exchange. Therefore, in 2015, this 2014, I beg your pardon, we raised the very phenomenal IPO, $550 million. It was the highest IPO in the Sub-Saharan Africa at the time, and, and it really made waves. From, from our perspective, it now became the trailblazing company that attracts investment into, into Nigeria and the African continent. Then, of course, during this period, we've actually delivered a number of other milestones. We decided that the company would grow both organically and by acquisition of further assets. We, during this period, apart from, of course, growing our reserves, our reserve when we took over was less than 200, millions, uh, 200 million barrels of oil equivalent. Today, we are almost 500 million, million barrels of oil equivalent. And of course, like you rightly said, with the acquisition of the ExxonMobil uh, uh, shares, uh, a company that we, we acquired from Delaware, that has become transformational for the company. And, and like we say in Seplat, it's not by chance. These are all deliberate efforts that were envisioned from the beginning. And what you would see that during this period, in fact, when we first started, gas was not a commodity that any Nigerian company was interested about. But of course, by the time we're shortly after our IPO, domestic gas price changed, and Seplat led the transformational investment in gas to the domestic market. At the time we started, our, our gas production uh, installed capacity was about 90 million scoff a day. Today, Seplat has 525 million scoff a day of gas processing capacity. Within a period of, 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 of five years, that's about five-fold increase. But 
Over and above that, we're, we, we're committed to making sure that we support the transformational agenda and growth in the Nigerian economy. So today, Seplat is supplying 30, 25 to 30% of gas to power in Nigeria. This is absolutely important. When you consider a country like Nigeria, 33% of unemployment <coughs> in the place. So once we make sure that we contribute to this gas to power, it's actually setting the stage to make sure that employment and prosperity is greater in the, uh, in the land. Then, of course, one of the things that this company has done over these years has been to deliver to our stakeholders. And, and these stakeholders, starting from our communities where we operate, the governments and the rest of them, and our partners, I'm sure that one of the things that Seplat is very happy about is that we stepped into the shoes of joint ventures that was before we came in, the preserve of the international oil companies. Today, we are now partners with NMPC, uh, the parent national oil company, partners with NPVC. And what is really very remarkable about this relationship is that within 10 years, we delivered $12.5 billion to this joint venture, which has never happened before by any uh, indigenous companies. In terms of taxes and royalties, within this period, we've delivered over $2 billion in taxes and royalties. So what we have done is to really make Swerplat a success story when you speak about the indigenous program in Nigeria. And we can only grow. Now, when you really put in context our acquisition of, of, of uh, ExxonMobil shares, that will simply grow again exponentially our reserves and production. Production will be hitting almost a billion, uh, well, reserve will be about a billion uh, uh, barrels of liquids alone. And of course, production will increase by almost 200%, uh, if, if not more to over almost 150 million barrels a day. But really, overall, what is important is that we're going to remain impactful in this space and aligned very committedly to, to, to the growth of the Nigerian economy. Thank Mark, you. Remarkable journey. Uh, Mr. Kamara, the, the Bailing 1X well has been a game changer for, for Cote d'Ivoire. Tell us about the discovery, um, what, it's, what it's meant for Cote d'Ivoire, and, and particularly, I'm, I'm interested in hearing from you how you worked with, with any to uh, pull off this uh, remarkable achievement. Again, everyone's got a uh, translation they can, they, they can listen to. Merci beaucoup. Alors, je vais demander aux uns aux autres de mettre euh, les écouteurs pour avoir la traduction en anglais. Je parlerai en français. La Côte d'Ivoire est un pays francophone. Et nous sommes heureux d'être sur ce panel pour euh, faire la promotion de la Côte d'Ivoire euh, dans ce monde euh, anglophone, et parce que nous voulons être ouverts euh, au monde entier. Euh, nous avons effectivement fait une grande découverte avec la société italienne Eni, une grande découverte qui a été baptisée du nom de Baleine au mois d'août 2021. Et pour la Côte d'Ivoire, c'est une bonne nouvelle, très bonne nouvelle. Nous étions déjà producteurs de pétrole, mais avec un volume relativement faible. Mais cette découverte de taille mondiale va nous permettre d'accroître considérablement notre production. Alors, il s'agit d'une découverte de, qui va contenir donc du pétrole brut et du gaz naturel associé. Ce pétrole brut euh, va servir, euh, va être commercialisé, donc va apporter des ressources pour euh, le pays, donc euh, qui permettront de développer le pays et d'améliorer le bien-être des populations. Il y a également du gaz naturel associé. Et ce gaz naturel, il va être utilisé pour produire de l'électricité. Et vous savez que dans nos pays africains, le taux d'électrification euh, n'est pas élevé. Donc, euh, avec donc, cette production d'électricité qui sera faite euh, avec ce gaz naturel associé, euh, nous allons pouvoir augmenter l'offre d'électricité aux populations et, et permettre euh, aux populations d'avoir accès à, à l'électricité et donc de se développer davantage. Alors, nous avons travaillé activement avec la société UNI euh, et la Société pétrolière nationale, qui s'appelle Petrocy, a travaillé vraiment au coude à coude avec ENI et le partenariat a été très fort, de sorte que euh, cette découverte a été faite et nous voulons la développer rapidement. 
rapidement. Euh, nous avons en prévision en 18 mois de commencer déjà une première étape de production avec à peu près 10 à 15 de la production à terme. Et ensuite, au bout de 4 ans, nous voulons passer à 100 de la production avec un plateau que nous allons maintenir pendant 20 ou 30 ans. Euh, et, et, et naturellement, cette découverte pose, et, et, et la production donc, de ce pétrole brut pose la question de la, euh, de la transition énergétique. Et justement, pour ne pas aggraver la situation de l'impact carbone lié donc, à, au développement de, ce, de cette découverte, euh, nous avons demandé à ENI de développer des projets de décarbonisation, de sorte que finalement, euh, il y ait un impact nul en termes de carbone, l'impact carbone lié au, à la production de ce champ soit neutre. Et donc, du coup, tout le monde y gagne. La situation carbone ne s'aggrave pas, mais la population de la Côte d'Ivoire euh, va profiter pleinement à la fois de la production de pétrole brut euh, et à la fois de la production de ce gaz naturel qui permettra donc d'avoir accès à plus d'électricité dans le pays. Voilà donc euh, ce qu'on peut dire. Donc c'est une bonne chose pour le pays et ce n'est pas grave pour la planète parce que l'impact carbone sera neutre pour nous. Thank you. Um, the energy transition seems to be the context in which this entire conference is, is taking place. Um, and you use the word transition, it sounds like this very smooth process, and it sounds like we're going to a, a brighter future. Um, Brian, can you tell us what your view is on, on the energy transition? You, you've grappled with it yourself. You moved from petroleum to, to energy. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on what it means for um, not just for your company, but also more broadly for, for Africa. Thank you very much. Uh, in Seplat, as you may have been aware, we last year rebranded the company uh, during our annual uh, Global Energy Summit in October last year. And, and what that really did was to repurpose the company and make it focused on making sure that we balance energy transition and all of the narratives about renewables with making sure that we create access to reliable and affordable energy in the environment. Not just in Nigeria, but of course, to, to create the framework for what will happen in, in, in the rest of African continent. Now, what you see in Nigeria, for example, just so that you can take everything in context, 200 million people, 33% of unemployment, energy per capita, 150 kilowatt hour global average 2,500 kilowatt hour. So you can see the gap. It's as though the, the nation is in darkness. So a company like ours, we're really committed to provide access to reliable energy. And therefore, what we, we decided to do is to take, of course, our purpose is to, to, to deliver energy solutions to society. And to do that, we, charity begins at home. So when we are sitting in very large gas resources, so we decided that we are going to deliver on, on, on the energy transition under three pillars. One is to focus on our upstream business, which of course has continued to generate a lot of revenues. If you may have seen our, our annual report of last year, $4 billion of, of total assets, EBITDA $400 million. So at the back of this, we'll continue to do our upstream business. But what we're focusing on here to make sure that we contribute to carbon neutrality, frankly, I prefer carbon neutrality to net zero. What we're doing is to make sure that we produce in a very efficient manner, energy efficiency, deploy technology that will indeed decrease the carbon that we, we, we put out in our footprint, and then we're determined to take out the flares. In Nigeria, part of the great problems uh, oil producing companies are having is the flares. So we start from there. In, in Sepra, we set the target 2024, we'll take out all the flares. And just to put the numbers around, this is over 400 million tons of, of carbon dioxide emission. So that is quite significant. So we believe that this is where to start. And then we focus again in the midstream. In our midstream business, what we're focusing on is the gas to power, because we believe that it makes absolutely no sense to leave all of the huge gas resources in our environment. Nigeria is keeping over 200 
trillion cubic feet of gas. So there is absolutely no way we cannot exploit this to deliver access to electricity. So we're focusing on this. And then, of course, in addition to this, because many people may not know this, when you speak about energy poverty in, in Africa and in Nigeria, 80% of this energy consumption is in the households. And when they do this, what they are really doing is using firewood and coal and HHK to provide cooking. Because when the children are hungry, they're not really talking about energy poverty from the point of view of switching on or for switching on electricity. So what we're doing is to make sure that in our midstream, we, we basically deliver LPG penetration as, as from, from our gas. And once we do this and displace the firewood and coal and HHK, we're going to be impacting the environment, removing the emissions. We're going to impact the social uh, environment. And of course, preserve the health of the people because disease control is a major, major uh, part of this. And then of course, in, in overall, we, we are also looking at using the midstream to impact the S of the ESG in, in the energy transition. Then of course, we have the, the fourth pillar where we are also focusing on new, uh, what we call the new energy business. In this sphere, we're looking at renewables and we're looking, interestingly, we're, we're believing that we'll be able to displace diesel generation in Nigeria. Now, so that you can understand what is going on in Nigeria, grid power in Nigeria is installed capacity 12,000 megawatts for 200 million people. But of these, only at about three to 5,000 megawatts get to destination. Meanwhile, the off-grid power by diesel generation is as high as 25,000 megawatts. Now, in terms of cost, the grid power is about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. The off-grid generator by diesel is as high as 60 cents per kilowatt hour. Our production across the fence is 3 cents. So from our company perspective, we're looking at the entire value chain to capture value between that five, 3 cents per, per kilowatt hour to 60 cents for diesel generation. So basically, in our energy transition, we're looking to how do we make sure that we deliver reliable access and affordable energy, as well as making sure that we do our business in a sustainable manner that will ensure carbon neutrality. And of course, Nigeria as a country has taken 2060 for, for zero, uh, net, net zero uh, carbon emission. We're totally aligned with that. That's uh, President Buhari's uh, commitment at, at, at COP26. So and we're, we're very aligned to that. So for us, it's a matter of the mix of energy that will deliver and mitigate the, the energy scarcity and energy poverty in our environment while protecting the climate. Thank you. I, I want, I'd like to move to the, the question of local content, which is connected to what we've been discussing. Um, companies are, uh, you, you've, you've mentioned that part of the, the upstream development involves industrialization um, and the associated benefits that come from the, the hydrocarbon development. Governments want uh, local content, um, but some see activities such as developing a skilled, skill, skilled workforce and building institutions such as schools and, and hospitals as government uh, responsibilities and not private sector responsibilities. Uh, Mr. Cameron, I wanted to ask you, what do you see as the, the correct role for the private sector and what's the correct role for the government and where do you draw that line? Merci. Alors, euh, dans le cadre donc du développement euh, de notre bassin sédimentaire et, et des découvertes que nous faisons, euh, nous souhaitons que euh, tout cela se fasse avec de la valeur ajoutée dans le pays. Et la valeur ajoutée, c'est non seulement les exportations de pétrole brut qui vont ramener des des ressources financières. Comme je le disais, le gaz qui va permettre d'avoir accès à l'électricité. Euh, mais également, nous voulons que euh, le contenu local soit développé. Et pour cela, euh, nous avons mis en place des programmes de formation avec les sociétés qui opèrent, donc, euh, qui, qui, qui développent nos, nos gisements. Des programmes de formation euh, pour euh, permettre à plus d'Ivoiriens, plus de nationaux, 
de se spécialiser dans ses métiers, des métiers très pointus, et de prendre part au développement de ces activités-là. Naturellement, l'État continue d'assurer de, son devoir de formation de base des, des écoles primaires, des collèges, des universités, des grandes écoles de formation d'ingénieurs. Mais euh, Donc ça, l'État continue de le faire. Euh, mais lorsque euh, nous avons une découverte, donc la question du local content euh, est mise en œuvre pour permettre d'avoir des formations plus pointues et, et, et donc euh, c est, c est, c est, ces coûts-là sont pris en charge par euh, les sociétés pétrolières, des fois dans les coûts pétroliers, euh, on, on, on situe le curseur pendant les négociations et, et ça permet donc d'impliquer plus de nationaux dans euh, le développement de ces, de ces gisements-là. Euh, je voudrais également ajouter que euh, l'électricité, la, pour la transition énergétique, euh, nous prévoyons qu'il euh, y ait un certain pourcentage d'énergie verte euh, à terme, à l'horizon 2030, euh, pour l'heure... Euh, à la COP21, nous avons fait une déclaration d'avoir 42% d'énergie renouvelable à l'horizon 2030. Et à la COP26, nous sommes allés plus loin que ça pour faire donc une déclaration d'avoir donc un pourcentage d'énergie renouvelable dans le mix énergétique à hauteur de 45%. Nous sommes donc passés de 42% à 45%. Tout cela vraiment pour confirmer notre engagement d'aller dans le sens de la transition énergétique et de faire ce développement que nous faisons dans le, dans le, dans le, dans le domaine pétrolier sans nuire à, à la planète. Et, et comme j'ai dit, et, et votre question portait donc sur le contenu local. Euh, et en plus de cela, nous avons développé, euh, mis en place une loi que nous sommes allés défendre à l'Assemblée nationale auprès du Parlement pour... Euh, euh, permettre que euh, la question du contenu local soit bien dans les textes et, et soit appliquée par les sociétés pétrolières qui viendront travailler totalement dans la légalité, et si bien que la limite est bien faite entre ce que l'État fait comme effort pour euh, euh, former la population, pour former les jeunes, pour former euh, les élèves, et ce que les sociétés pétrolières font comme apport pour que le local content se développe et qu'il y ait plus de nationaux qui interviennent dans la production, euh, le domaine de la production pétrolière, le domaine de la production de l'énergie, aussi bien au niveau des emplois qu'au niveau des services, qu'au niveau des biens. Il faut donc qu'il y ait plus d'implication, de, euh, de sorte que le développement de tout ça soit harmonieux, qu'on qu qu respecte la, les questions de transition énergétique et qu'on améliore le bien-être des populations et également qu'on permette à, au maximum des nationaux euh, de participer à ce, à ce développement dans le domaine du, de l'énergie du pétrole. Brian, I'd like you to provide the, uh, the private sector view and, and local content. Where is the right line between if you're Neo, if you're a liberal, classic liberal uh, economist, you'll say that the, the job of an IOC is to follow the laws and to pay taxes. But obviously there's a lot more that's expected of IOCs today. Where's the right line between uh, government and, and private sector? The government and private sector, it, it's really interesting. And, I, and I'll use Nigeria as an example. Recently, uh, the, the federal government uh, passed into law the Petroleum Industry Act, which had been, you know, on the drawing board for almost 30 years. Obviously, that removed a lot of uncertainty. So, what we're going to be seeing is a lot of drive for investment into into this space, and, and we're playing this. But from our perspective, we believe that government should really focus on creating the right enabling environment for investment flow to flow from from the private sector. In our own case, and a case in point is what we did in gas. 2000 and, 
12, Nigeria came into what they call the gas revolution, which is gas to power, gas to industry, and gas to agriculture. And then at that time, changed uh, the, the domestic gas price. And at the back of that, it became attractive to invest in the domestic price. Just to, to let you know, during this period, uh, Henry Hope price had fallen from $13 per thousand uh, scoff of, of gas to as low as three. Meanwhile, the gas to power in the domestic market was as high as $3. So that attracted a lot of investment, and that's what we do. So basically, government role will be to keep putting the right framework and policies to enable the investments to flow. Recently in Nigeria, of course, they de the, the government declared what they call the decade of gas. One of the things we find very useful in this decade of gas is that it really removed some kind of uncertainty between what we call the domestic gas obligation to your total gas produced in the domestic market. So that enables a company like ours to be able to supply gas to willing buyer, willing seller, which is more attractive and all of that. But of course, going forward, we're looking to even deepen this uh, as we go along. Now, one of the things that our government has also done recently, which we believe that government should really uh, review their position on this, is price control around, around uh, commodities. Recently, government decided to put a cap on the domestic uh, uh, gas, gas price. We believe that this should be allowed to float so that competition and investment will drive the price. And our view is that it's only a matter of time that this will go down. And I'll explain why. If you look at the Africa continent, and of course Nigeria I spoke about before, if you have a continent that has 600 million people without electricity, price control should not be where to go. But basically what you should do is to attract investments so that the private sector competitiveness will then be what will drive the price. And it's only a matter of time that price per kilowatt hour will go down just like what has happened in telecommunication industry. And that is what I believe that government should be doing. You, you sound like you're in the liberal school of economics. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Michelle Luna, I'd like to, to ask you about oil and upstream. Um, you share a political border with, uh, in geological basins with Angola, which is a longtime <coughs> hydrocarbon power. Yet, Namibia is only seeing discoveries now. What took so long? Well, <laughs> um, okay, I, I got a very good answer for that. But before I answer that question, let me just say a few words on the energy transition. Sure, we'll talk about. Please. Some of you remember, not well, maybe sometimes back. Some of you still remember the Economist newspaper that had the headline: "The Dark Africa, the Dark Continent." Of course, yes. And then after then, the Africa, the Hopeless Continent. And then I think 10 years later, it was Africa rising. Africa rising. Yeah, Africa rising. remember that? Africa rising. Now, suddenly Africa is discovering all these all west, uh, east, south. Uh, and then you really want to think Africa is rising. It's really rising now. But then somebody says, wait a minute. Uh, we need to start now transitioning from this because this resource is no longer good for us to actually to use that, and therefore we need to move on. Uh, and we are like, that's not fair. It's not fair at all. Africa, in fact, if you think about when people talk about energy transition, if you ask an, an average African, they like, what are we? Oh, we don't have energy. Uh, and therefore, we cannot be seen to be transitioning from anything, because we need to start doing something. Uh, from, from less carbon to more carbon. <laughs> it's, it, it's really. If you think about the statistic there says 11 African states out of the whole 54 countries, 11, up to 90% of their population do not have access to modern electricity whatsoever. They don't have it. Sub-Saharan Africa as a whole consume less electricity per year than the state of Alabama in the US. Just one state of Alabama, five million people. So, we, we cannot actually, as Africans, start talking about Africa's transition. And don't, make me, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we, we do not care about the climate. We definitely do. We know that something needs to be done. But I think it will be really a wrong advice for people to advise, advise them and say, simply stop doing it uh, and just then go on renewable. 
in, in some of our countries, like he was saying, high unemployment, underdevelopment, and therefore this resource can actually help us to get the revenue that we need to be able then to go on the energy transition that people are talking about. So that is very important that I mean, you know, we should be allowed to be able to do that. Uh, and in fact, in Namibia, we are doing both. Uh, in Namibia, we, because of the uh, uh, world-class renewable resource we have got in terms of wind and solar, we actually have embarked on a project actually where we can start producing green hydrogen. Uh, we do have the, the likes of the uh, European countries like Germany, Belgium, uh, who are actually um, teaming up with us to invest in the green hydrogen assets. And therefore, it's not to say we don't care, but we just say, let's be allowed to really move and use some of these resources to make sure that actually African economies develops in such a way that they can also be in a position to actually do the, um, the, the transition. Quickly on the, on the local content. The local content issues, it's always discuss, discussed in a way like somehow states want to get something unduly from the, from the investors. You want to grab something, that's why I talk about local content. You, you couch it to say local content, but what you want is take away from something. It's really misunderstood. If we all talk about uh, mutually beneficial investment. Local content always it means that you know, the state in which we are investing should benefit from that investment. That's all what it means. But it's always discussed as if government want to take away something from an investor, but we're simply coaching as local content. So, but we need to really to understand you know, from the investors and the state to make sure that actually that's what we're talking about. Now, why, took, why did it take so long? Uh, I, I, it took that long because the investors were just looking at the wrong, the wrong, the wrong places. It's, I think. it's their fault. I think <laughs> that's yes, yes, their fault. Okay. It's their fault. Uh, no, seriously, they I think... do a better job. <laughs> I think, I think uh, uh, investing in oil, I know, is, is very expensive. Uh, doing exploration is very expensive. Um, country need to have certain uh, incentive that can be afforded to the investor to be able to come into the country and do explorations. We need to have sure that our licensing and permitting uh, um, procedures and processes are actually in place, make it easier for people to do that. And that's what we have in Namibia. So all along we knew that something, somewhere there's some oil there, and therefore we just made sure that we continue to encourage potential investors to say, our system is open, uh, the permitting system is very clearly, um, uh, there's, no, there's no change of law that will make uh, it difficult for you to invest and therefore suddenly things have changed. And I think that will help us to actually keep the investors interested in the Namibian uh, oil and gas sectors to, to invest and there we are. And also probably because of the, of the proximity of the Angolan um, oil, uh, somehow that also encouraged us to say there has to be some oil um, uh, in Namibia. Uh, and here we are, and as I said, we are, we are quite excited um, that this is, has happened, and we look forward to work with our partners to make sure that uh, it comes onto production as soon as possible, especially now that we, we are transitioning, so we need to do this quickly, um, so that at least we, need to cut we monetize this. No, you're uh, you're this all, the, all, all the above. Yes. Hydrogen, <laughs> oil, it's all good. Uh, just one more question for you about, um, about, about the upstream. Mm -hmm. Who do you compete with when, for investment, when you, th when you see all these destinations around the world where people could put money, who do you compete with, and, and what's your competitive advantage? We, as, as now, for example, we're talking about Angola. We don't want to be seen as like competitors to Angola. Not necessarily, really. Uh, we can be collaborators. Uh, we can learn from each other. Um, especially now that we have discovered we discovered, obviously, we, we go to our, our neighboring countries where oil has been discovered and talk to them as to how best we do not make some of the mistakes they've made. But obviously, as I said, uh, each country will also need to attract the investors, and what we, what we do is really just to make sure that our legal framework is, is it's solid, um, our fiscal policy is, uh, with regard to this oil and gas is, is, is solid and well understood. Uh, and also, I think in Namibia, probably because of the size of, of the country, we, we, we are a huge country geographically, um, but we are only about three million people. So I think it makes it easier also when you are small 
unlike Nigeria, who has got, I don't know even <laughs> how you guys manage that, how you manage to have you know, more than 100 million people. <laughs> but when you are 3 million people, it's much easier to manage. Uh, and therefore, it makes it actually easy and, and more uh, decision-making process is much, much quicker. Uh, we don't take too long to decide. Um, we make sure where we need to put something on the table and discuss with an investor, we do that. Uh, because for us, it's very important so that at least the investors know exactly what we're looking for. We also need to understand what they're looking for so that at least it's discussed and it's resolved. So um, to, to make us really um, more competitive, just to say our, our internal processes, actually how to deal with investors, is such that it's robust. Um, and there's also a saying that apparently, you know, you know, small is sexier. So, you know, we are just a small, a sexier country, so. so. <laughs> That's a great line. Well, as I was saying, you know, I don't know how many of you have been to Namibia, so please you know, do come to Namibia and have a look at what it is. Yeah. Minister Camera, you got the, the, the uh, Bailing One, uh, 1X Discovery has uh, de-risked a new basin. Um, are you planning a new bid round for, uh, uh, for, for Cote d'Ivoire to bring in new investors? Tell us about that. Alors donc, euh, avec cette découverte euh, qui est faite, euh, découverte du rang mondial, euh, nous, avons, nous avions déjà des blocs en production et nous avons donc euh, pour projet de, de continuer de poursuivre euh, la production de ces blocs et, et même euh, de faire des workovers pour augmenter cette production. En ce qui concerne la découverte qui vient d'être faite, j'ai déjà indiqué tantôt que nous travaillons activement pour la mettre en, en production euh, avec ENI. Et il, le bassin sédimentaire euh, de la Côte d'Ivoire est, est là, disponible. Nous voulons inviter les opérateurs et les sociétés pétrolières et les investisseurs euh, à venir en Côte d'Ivoire pour euh, faire l'exploration de ce bassin et continuer de produire. Euh, les sociétés pétrolières sont là, ENI est là, la société italienne, la société française Total est là, euh, la société anglaise Tulo est là, la société canadienne CNR est là. Donc euh, nous invitons les autres investisseurs à venir en Côte d'Ivoire pour, pour développer l'exploration de notre bassin sédimentaire et produire davantage de, de, de nos ressources dont nous avons besoin. Mon collègue ministre de la Namibie disait, nous avons, nous, le, le taux d'accès à l'énergie est faible dans nos pays. Nous avons besoin de, de développer nos ressources, eh, nos ressources énergétiques pour permettre à la population de profiter davantage de cela pour développer le pays. Et je le disais que tous ces développements ne se font pas au détriment de l'impact carbone. Nous les faisons en conservant, en ayant un impact carbone neutre. Donc nous invitons les sociétés pétrolières à venir en Côte d'Ivoire. Euh, le cadre est bon, la fiscalité est bonne, euh, les contrats de partage de production sont favorables. Nous permettons d'ailleurs aux opérateurs, aux, aux sociétés pétrolières d'amortir les coûts pétroliers euh, assez rapidement, euh, de rentrer donc, euh, de les rembourser assez rapidement. Euh, jusqu'à ce que le cost oil va, va, va jusqu'à 80% dès les premières années, de sorte que euh, les investissements importants qui ont été faits par les sociétés pétrolières puissent être remboursés rapidement. Donc c'est un cadre très incitatif que nous avons en Côte d'Ivoire. Et donc nous, nous invitons les sociétés et les investisseurs à venir chez nous pour euh, développer davantage euh, cette activité qui, encore une fois, va permettre au, à la population, au pays, euh, voilà, d'avoir un développement harmonieux, aux, aux, aux populations de vivre mieux et euh, sans altérer l'impact carbone euh, sur la planète. Merci. Uh, we have about five minutes left, so I'm going to ask everyone to... to I've got one last question. Um, question looking out to the future. I'm going to ask everyone to keep your uh, uh, responses concise. Brian, uh, you seem to have a little bit of talent of creating a vision and actually achieving it. 
What's the vision for Supplet in 10 years? 10 years from now, it's going to be a combination of many things. One is to leverage on what we've already uh, created a very good platform, leverage on technology to make sure that we decarbonize in our operations. In fact, our view is to uh, really achieve what can be called the zero carbon barrels. That's what we're looking at. The second point, of course, is to leverage on the environment and make sure that we provide access to electricity that is reliable and affordable to, to community. And of course, to continue to grow uh, where we are today. I, I spoke about the ExxonMobil acquisition. One of the things we're hoping, and of course, giving uh, government uh, 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 um, a regulatory framework that will approve this transaction very quickly. And, and some of the people in this room know what I'm talking about. That will completely uh, leapfrog our development for the future, and we're looking forward to that. Then one final message about energy transition, and, and it is not really about the north-south divide. I think this is to speak about a structured and organized way globally that energy transition will become meaningful to everyone. It is not the case that there will be no uh, fossil fuels anymore. It's not about molecules and uh, vessels, electrons. It's a combination of the two. So when we speak about energy transition, we, we call on the OECD countries who have already used the same resources to allow the developing countries to also have access to so it. So en energy we transitions. Do, we do that, that is the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Kamar, your 10-year vision, please. Where will Cote d'Ivoire be in 10 years for the energy sector, or for the upstream sector? Yes. Alors, dans les dix prochaines années, tu le disais, nous avons l'intention de développer toutes les ressources pétrolières et minières pour permettre et pour venir en support au développement du pays et au bien-être des populations et à la baisse de la pauvreté, à l'accès à l'énergie, à l'électricité. Et tout cela euh, avec, euh, une, euh, en respectant la transition énergétique, nous avons pris l'engagement d'avoir euh, un pourcentage de l'énergie renouvelable dans l'ensemble, dans le mix énergétique, de 45% à l'horizon 2030. Euh, et ces énergies renouvelables, il y a l'hydraulique, il y a le solaire, il y a la biomasse, euh, ainsi de suite. Donc nous avons euh, cet objectif que nous poursuivons et donc nous voulons développer harmonieusement le pays en respectant la transition énergétique. Nous voulons également impliquer le contenu local, faire en sorte que ce développement se fasse avec de la valeur ajoutée créée et pour tout le monde, de sorte que les populations ivoiriennes, les sociétés ivoiriennes, les biens produits en Côte d'Ivoire puissent être valorisés pour avoir de la création de valeur sur toute la chaîne. Donc nous insistons également sur cet aspect du contenu local qui dans les dix années devrait s'améliorer grâce à la loi que nous avons votée au Parlement pour encadrer tout cela, pour que ces choses soient faites de façon harmonieuse. Donc voici ce que nous prévoyons pour, naturellement, plus de découvertes, plus de production, plus de bien-être des populations, plus d'accès à l'électricité et plus de contenu local pour résumer nos objectifs dans, à l'horizon 2030, dans 10-15 ans. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. Mr. Alwindo. What's your vision for where Namibia's upstream will be in 10 years? Two things. What we would want to see in Namibia for the next 10 years is that every Namibian, wherever they find themselves, they have got access to electricity, affordable electricity uh, and reliable electricity. That's really our vision to make sure that happens. The second one, as I've talked earlier about our uh, uh, green hydrogen, um, process we have started. We want to make sure in the next 10 years, Namibia has become a continental hub as a global, um, as a continental hydro uh, hydrogen production company, uh, country. Uh, that will then in itself, not only 
make Namibia to contribute to the decarbonization, but actually, actually help the globe to decarbonize. And those are really our two uh, major goals we have for the next two years. Uh, and that can only obviously be possible if we get the right investors to come and co-create with us, to come and co-collaborate with us, because we actually uh, view the investors as co-collaborators with us. It's not really like, you know, they are, they, they are there and we are there. But, you know, when we get together, we have to do things together. And therefore, in fact, the earlier question, we don't actually see who's supposed to do what. If something must be done, we sit around and say, who can do it best? And therefore, whoever can do it, private sector or the government, we do it together. But those are the two goals we have for the next two years. Thank you. Unfortunately, our time, we can uh, definitely continue this conversation much longer. Um, just to, to summarize some quick thoughts, it seems like the, there seems to be a, some agreement, some consensus, uh, emphasis, on, emphasis on working very hard to expand energy access and economic development through the upstream um, partnerships between the public and private sector, and um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of care for the environment, um, but an energy transition that takes into consideration the specific characteristics that, uh, that uh, typify uh, African countries. Uh, I really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you all very much for um, joining us, Minister Alwindo, uh, Mr. Kamara, Brian. Um, thank you for uh, sharing your insights with us. Thank you. Thank you.